Good morning. I know we had a problem Saturday with our technology, and I apologize for that. I heard from Ernie that the message was somewhat garbled, so I'm going to try to do a better job today, and this would be something you can show yourselves individually, if you wish, at home. I was talking about my father. I told you, first of all, that I was a priest for 48 years, and I've been a chaplain of the order for 20 years. Uh, I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, where my dad raised all his family, my mom, Kathleen. Basically, but I'm going to talk about my favorite sub subject today is my father. Uh, he was a very special man. He was born on May 5th, 1910, and died uh, November 2nd, 1976. So for me, a very short life, only 66 years. I can remember when I passed 66 myself about seven, eight years ago, how I felt about the fact that I actually outlived my father. It's a kind of shocking thing to me to realize that he has been dead now for over 40 years and I now surpassed him in age. But I remembered many different things about him that are worth sharing. I know that you had a chance to listen and to share and to pray together my dad stations last Saturday, so you know what a great man by his writings he was. But he was more than just a man of writing, he was a man of speech and a man of, of wonderful words and appropriate words for all the right occasions. Um, you know, my dad died in aneurysm. Uh, interesting that I had the same operation uh, that he had uh, just this last August, I'm absolutely fine. Uh, he died. The progress of medicine over the last 40 years is amazing. He was a writer all his life. He was always a writer. Probably because he had a terrible stutter as a young boy, and that made a difference in his, in his uh, ability to, to write, honing those skills even more. Uh, as a young boy, he was so affected by this disability, he couldn't go to the store and ask for a loaf of bread or a bottle of milk without writing it down. Um, it was just a terrible uh, difficulty for him, and yet he overcame that over the years. Um, he's a father of 13. He and my mom had 13 kids, eight girls and five boys. I remember for, th for 39 years before he died, he became a deacon at the age of 63 in, 19, um, 70, uh, in 1972, and uh, he preached my first mass. And that particular uh, the great occasion for me, he preached my first mass, and I was blessed to be able to preach at his funeral and his months by mass a few, um, uh, about a month later. Uh, great writings, you've heard one of them, It Was Way the Cross. He also wrote Mother Self in 1957. He wrote uh, In the Presence of God in 1962. He wrote The, the, the um, Everyone's Way of the Cross in 1970. Um, and those people we are, we finished for him in 1978 after he died. Here's some stories about, I think they're worth listening to about my dad, it showed kind of the person he, what he was. So we grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of DC. And um, uh, one story was about my going off to high school. So I've been to a lady of word school in Bethesda for um, nine years and had a sister teaching all the classes all the way through. One teacher for each class and each day, and that worked out just fine. Um, but I went to St. John's High School, we had seven different teachers for seven subjects. And my first six weeks were very, very difficult. Um, I was shocked after a couple of weeks to find out I was, wasn't doing very well. Went to my father and said, Dad, I'm not doing that well. I'm having trouble. He said, don't worry. It's just it's a transition. You'll make the transition. I was a pretty good student, almost all A's and a few B's in grade school. So my report card came it's after six weeks, and I was more shocked. I had actually failed four out of seven subjects. I got lower than 70 and 70 and four out of seven subjects. And I was frankly rather frightened to go take this report card home by my father. Um, not that it was very difficult, but just was embarrassed by it. I took the report card home and showed it to him. And his first response was, you know, John, this is kind of my fault too. You warned me, I didn't pay attention to you. And he said, but your mom is really good in history and English. She'll help with those. I'm really good in Latin, I'll help with that. Your sister's really good in math, she'll help with that. And they began to tutor me. What we found out was that I was not a verbal learner. I was an audio learner. I was listening to sisters teach so well. I'd hear it once or twice, I'd have it. In reading it, I was not that great. And I found I was not comprehending. I, mean, I could read the words, wasn't comprehending. And my mom and others told me how to comprehend. I remember reading the chapters of a book, my mom was an avid reader, and finding out that frankly, I would read a chapter and my mom would say, well, tell me about these things that happened. I couldn't remember. What, what age was Joe when he, when he died? Could remember. You know, what kind of career did Joe have? Could remember. Read it again. Read it again. 
and begin to realize you can really concentrate more and more. Sounds, sounds strange, doesn't it? To concentrate more and more on the reading, but I learned how to really reflect and then read it better. So all the subjects were, were better within about six more weeks and came out the first semester with, with no, um, uh, no, no failures. And then went on to the rest of my career at St. John's. At graduation, my father again, man for words, says to me that really made a big difference. He said to me, you know, John, uh, at the graduation, at the graduation, you know, um, a lot of awards came out today. You didn't get any awards. I'll tell you this. Gary came as far in four years of high school as you did. Because I finished my junior year with second honors, with my senior year with first honors. Um, I'd really become a pretty good student. And it's because basically of that gift of learning how to read, my father's great understanding. Another instant, something like that took place at St. John's as well. I just got in my car, uh, a license for my car to drive, and then my own car, but the family car. And I took the car one day to a football game, St. John's against Roosevelt, in a neighborhood I wasn't familiar with. And in parallel parking the car, I scratched the side of the car. Embarrassed, upset, feeling bad, my first car accident. Came home. My dad was came home from work, and I said, Dad, I had an accident today. I scratched the side of the car. Now, it was the only new car we had in our family for years, and I scratched it. So basically, he came out, looked at the car, and said, hmm. So John, if I didn't know better, I'd say the lines of that little accident matched the lines of the car. Again, I saw this very differently than, than I did. He saw it with chance for, you know, for, for growth and not a need for punishment. He asked me to earn some money to pay back the deductible, which I did. And basically did that as a way of more responsibility. But again, his reaction was so, so uh, good for me to hear in such a special way. Uh, I remember also um, the time basically when um, I was one day at the grade school um, at the dinner table. And I was basically, in our family was 15 at the dinner table. It's a very large crowd. And as I was drinking uh, the milk on the table, I reached out to talk to my sister for my glass of milk. I got the wrong glass. I got the bottle of milk in my hand, and not on purpose, and drank from that bottle, a quart bottle of milk. And my dad, who was pretty calm, got pretty upset. He basically said, John, what are you doing? What kind of, what, what, what are you, that's terrible. You, who was gonna drink out of that bottle down there? I went on and on for a second. I, I deserved it, I did it, so I wasn't up that upset about it. But later on that night, he came to see me. He said, John, he said, no, you wrong. What I did was more wrong. So I, I, I put you down in front of your, your, your siblings and your mom. That was wrong. I had a bad day at, at office. My, my secretary didn't come to work. She was sick. My boss had a couple of deadlines to, to meet. My, my writing I didn't get those done in time. I came home in a bad mood, and you got the brunt of it. I'm sorry. This shows you that your dad is human as well. Again, what a great lesson to learn as a young teenager about what it was to basically um, you know, know your father was perfect, but even then he made some mistakes along the way. Um, I've oftentimes said that everything I learned about um, my dad, about, about God, I learned from my father. I remember back when I was a little boy, in maybe first grade, learning our father. And sister said one day, God is like your father. And I must tell you, in all honesty, I want me to think, if God is like my father, God must be spectacular. I think I've lived by that belief my entire life. I don't believe in a God who just wants to punish me. I don't believe in a God who wants to be unjust to me. I believe in a God who wants me to do my best. I believe in a God who's merciful and kind and loving and understanding. That's what I believe in. I believe that God wants the best of me. My father always did as well. But it wasn't about judgment or justice. It was more about just doing the best you can. That's what really counted. What a gift to have that in my life. So I've learned about my, from God, I think I've learned from my father, kindness, compassion, mercy, care, responsibility. All those I learned, by, learned from my father, great gifts to have throughout my life. I think basically also of um, my, my dad's writings. So he wrote a book called My Other Self, published in 1957. And it's a story that I've never forgotten. Basically, that same day the book was going to be published, got the letter from Bruce Publishing, it was the same day that my sister, you know, Mr. Brenda, was born, 1957. It was in January. And dad went to the hospital to see my mom. 
they had the letter with, with him to show my mom that he got this letter saying he had the books would be published. He gave my mom, my mom was so happy that he'd had this book published. And my dad said to my mom, you know something? That's a great thing, but it doesn't compare with what you just did, bring another child into the world. That was his basic belief in life. Protects your human life, so important to him. And again, always a man with the right words, what a great gift he was. Uh, so the other self basically was became a very popular book among lots of people. A priest friend said to him, why don't you as a layman write a book about spirituality because there aren't many written by lay people. But as a writer, a part of agriculture for 32 years, a speech writer, an information specialist, had the writing skills, also a very good spirituality that became the beginning of other self. In 1970, he wrote Everyone's Way of the Cross, which uh, you're going to use, which you did use, basically, um, as part of your uh, day of retreat. It's a beautiful reflection. He sold that to Bruce Publishing, or Abbey Mayor Press, excuse me, sold it for $500. I used to tease my dad, saying, Dad, you were not a good businessman, you were a great writer, because that stays in the cross, has sold over 4 million copies. It's amazing, 4 million copies have been used all over the world, have been used, I've been in other countries, I've seen that in, in different uh, book racks, other places. It's amazing what that book has accomplished. And Auburn's Way of the Cross is a, is a really classic. It's just uh, a mother's self, classical writing of somebody who did the best he could every day. He shared a spiritual with those in need. So a great story there. Um, how do you balance life with 13 kids, the government job for 32 years, the call to basically to, you know, be involved in other things as well, how do you balance that, basically? It was an amazing thing to watch for me and for my siblings. We'd come home at times and watch my dad at the dining room table um, with his uh, pecking away at the typewriter or sometimes just sitting, reflecting amidst all kinds of chaos. You imagine with that many kids, the chaos and the fun and the joy of being together at home. We were not quiet kids. Uh, we're not bad kids, but not quiet kids. And then my dad had an ability to write and reflect You know, each and every wrote it's amazing. He balanced prayer and work in a very special way. Um, his spirituality was service and prayer. It's a classic story of that, one that I think has always been important to me at Catholic Charities. So when I was about maybe seven or eight years old, one day we're gonna go to Catholic Church, basically the daily mass, and the church was about the box. So we came out, got our both of my sisters, my two five us, or five of us or so, and a man came down the street. And he was an African American man, which wasn't that common in our neighborhood back then, Bethesda. And my dad stopped and talked to him. They had a conversation. And the next thing I knew, I watched my father take his coat off his back and give the coat basically to this man. And the man took the coat, put it on, and walked down the street. My dad went back in the house. We hadn't left yet and got another coat uh, from, from his hat from the house. Came back out. I said to my dad, Dad, what happened? He said, The guy was cold. I said, Dad, you gave him your jacket and you gave him your coat. Well, he said the guy was cold. But that's his response. And that was on the way to church. Service, prayer, prayer and service. Had a teacher from seminary taught us, basically, we were called, basically, he said, you got to do your service project, Apostolic Ministries, that you should bring it back to the altar here in the chapel. And you leave the altar to the chapel, that call you back to ministry outside. You said, you're going to yang. And basically, it happened with all of us, particularly Order of Malta, the prayer. Should bring us to service. The service should bring us back to prayer. That should be part of who we are as men and women of the Order of Malta. Um, he was involved in the St. Vincent de Paul Society. With all that work he had going on, he would go to visit people. Before the Eucharistic ministers, couldn't take communion back then, just to visit, spend a half an hour or so with elderly women. Pretty amazing thing. People who couldn't get out would go and spend a half an hour or so on a, every other week basis with people who were homebound, couldn't get out. With all the else going on, he did that regularly. He was a member of the choir, sang in the choir, sometimes led the choir. Um, he was on various parish councils, and we had parish councils back then, but there were councils and almost kitchen cabinets. He was on various groups doing the work as well. Um, he would really had a great devotion to the parish. Our Lady of Lords was our parish, fittingly, with our trip to Lords each year. That was our parish, Bethesda. He was very committed to that. One day he asked me, I'd go with him for adoration. It was a Saturday, and the church had a process of having uh, adoration every single hour of every day. And basically, there were usually two people um, in, in adoration. There was nobody to his part of that day. So he asked me if I'd go with him. And basically, to be honest with you, I didn't want to go. It's a Saturday, you know, 12 noon, 1 o'clock, I didn't want to go. 
So we both go, I guess, so he asked me, I said, okay, so I went. We went, we're sitting there, and I, I and we're now on our knees, I look over my father. He's reading my other song. I can't wait to get out of church. I can't wait to get out. So I asked him, so we come out of church. I'm out in the best place. I said, Dad, what do you read your own book for? What was that about? Like, what, what's this about? He said, John, this was a book I do not remember writing. I wrote it for sure. But I wrote it, I think, with myself in God's hands. Some of these thoughts, some of these inspirational things, I think, came directly from God to me. I didn't have a members of doing that. And I thought about, after that later on, when it came time when my dad died, I was preaching his funeral, and my dad died, he was died on November 2nd, 1976, and so he died like on a Monday or Tuesday night, I think Monday night. And so Tuesday night I was home, and then Wednesday night I came home, I said I gotta write this homily for Friday, and I began to write, and I, I basically put on my dad's favorite music, which is the Handless Messiah, put that on, it was playing, I began, I sat down to do an outline with a yellow pad, and I wrote, and I wrote more than the outline. I kept writing. I wrote for less than a half an hour. And basically then put it basically on, on, the, on the table and went to bed. When I woke up in the morning, I picked it up. And basically, it was done. I mean, I wrote the whole thing for sure. But it was, it was done. And I thought to myself later on, um, God was involved in that. And my dad's publisher said to me after, after the homily, said, John, that hobby was inspired. And I said, well, thank you very much. He's done it. I don't mean that. I mean, God used you in an inspirational way to speak the message of your father's life. I believe that was true. God actually wrote that with me. I uh, maybe like the way God helped write the scriptures, the people of the Old Testament. God helped me to write that in a very special way. It's a very special gift. I remember buying my dad a radio, basically, for his car. Believe it or not, back then, every car had a radio. His car never ready, did not have a radio. I had put in, basically installed for him in, in the car in a special way. And um, uh, basically, um, my mom helped me do that. And um, he said one day, you know, John, I have this radio, but I don't use it very much because on the way to work, half an hour ride, way home from work, half an hour ride, I spend time in prayer every day. That, that's my really quiet time for prayer as I'm riding back and forth from work downtown. Um, again, he used the radio for me, ball games, whatever, but it was not a constant thing. He didn't take it away from his time for prayer. Um, my dad had some health issues. Um, the biggest one I mentioned earlier, his stutter. Uh, it, was, it was really debilitating, really difficult for him. Basically, he wasn't able to speak words very well. And years later, when he got to work in agriculture, he decided to go to Toastmasters. It was a pretty brave thing. Imagine you got a terrible stutter, you go to Toastmasters, which is a, a group that just learns how to speak better and, and give, or, or give uh, the talks to other people. And one of the first assignments he was given was to give a talk about himself for two minutes. And home prepared it, easy to talk prepare. Came back and he was asked to give it. It took him 10 minutes to give a two minute talk. 10 minutes. And basically, um, during that talk, uh, he struggled a lot. When he finished, he was supposed to be evaluated. And the head of the group said this he said, he was called him Doc because he was a doctor in sociology. Doc, he said, You know, that was very difficult for you and for us for you to make that talk. He said, Let me tell you something that's important. What you've got to say is worth waiting for. I'll wait for your talk anytime you want to speak. That was a very important thing for my father. Opened up a whole new horizon about how important it was to try to be able to work through this. And eventually my father won an international speech contest. Basically, uh, he won in Maryland, he won Atlantic City, he won in Montreal, internationals contest, because he really had the gift, basically, of learning to write a gift he already had learning how to do that in a way with, with, with some success as a speaker. That was a big challenge for him. So that was one big challenge for him. The other challenge he had, when he was, maybe when I was like eight or nine years old, he had a detached retina in his 40s. Uh, back then, detached retinas were really tough. And he went to Johns Hopkins and Dr. Pearson, Johns Hopkins, and had to have the operation and stay in bed without turning over for 30 straight days. It was so difficult to make sure that retina would attach and not, not detach. It's a man in the hospital with him who had four or five detached retinas. So stayed in that position without turning over for four or five, for, for 30 days. Um, when he came home, I was so shocked to see he could not walk. His muscles atrophied so much he couldn't walk for 30 days in the hospital. He couldn't even walk at all. Um, and yet in that hospital, it was there. He converted his nurse to become a Catholic. Um, that time spent in, in bed was enough her to see in him, the spirituality of someone who's close to God, 
she wanted that for herself. That was a great story as well. And finally, my dad died with an aneurysm. And we had it for a week. We operated on the upper tail with GW. Um, the operation was successful. I was told the doctor came to see me during the operation, but then we tried to get the heart started. He wouldn't start again. And he died. Uh, it's, um, he had a, basically a very healthy life, except for those three things going on that made it difficult for him. Um, it was not useful for, for, for people to impress with my dad. Um, he had a special kindness, a special smile, a special uh, compassion, special care. People really were drawn to my father, um, even with that stutter. Uh, he had something special about him that made him a, a wonderful man to be with, with a great, great sense of humor. So conclusion, basically, uh, I just want to say a couple of things to conclusion. Number one, um, what have you learned, or what have I helped you to think about these stories from my father that might affect you? He was, frankly, an ordinary man like all of us. He was extraordinary in his spirituality, extraordinary in his kindness, extraordinary in his right ability and his ability to say the right words at exactly the right time. He really had a great gift for that. I remember basically when we turned 21 in our house, my dad would have written a note to us, each of us. It was under the door when I woke up my 21st birthday. And in the note, it said this. It said, John, 21 years ago today, your mom and I took you to the hospital. And three or four days later, you came home, basically. And you've been a joy to us ever since. And they would talk about basically the gifts. Instead of me, frankly, he said, you know, you're not the smartest of our kids. And that's really true. That's smart. said, but you have a gift of common sense and a gift of care for others that many others do not have. Use that great gift of natural leadership that you guys given you and use it well. You know, I still got that letter. Every one of us got that letter, a letter like that, with our own gifts and talents, good and bad, put before us to think about. So you head, head into adulthood. It was a great gift to us all. So in your multi service, to see yourself using the gifts God's given to you and using those gifts for, for others in, again, ordinary gifts, but use extraordinary well. Well, the Teresa talked about that as well. We use ordinary gifts, do a great job with that. I remember, you know, as, as, a, as a youngster that my dad was holy, I thought, but he was holy because he did things the best he could. I went to confession way back before I was ordained. The priest said to me, he said, John, God won't judge whether you're perfect or not. We will judge whether you'll try to be perfect. That's been my goal ever since. Try and be perfect and never make it. I try every day to be the best I can possibly be. And that's what God judges us on. Not do we reach success, but I try my best to do what God wants me to do. Um, so I hope you have a time for daily prayer. If you're using now 10 minutes of prayer, make it 15. Use now 20 minutes of prayer, make it 25. If you're using now already any time of prayer, make it five minutes. Every day, spend some time just talking to the Lord. Talking to the Lord, just a conversation about what you're trying to do what you hope to accomplish, what you hope to be, that's important. Um, the way you practice your faith is an example to others. I promise you that. The way you practice your faith exemplifies others. I remember there was a friend when I was at St. John's High School, used to go to Mass um, on, on the weekends with my dad, Saturday mornings. He was a football player, an excellent football player. He was all metropolitan in football and basketball. He weighed about uh, 160. He wasn't a big guy back in the, in, the, in the 60s. He wasn't a big guy, but he was a very fast, very good athlete. And I used to see him at church with the St. John's jacket on Saturday mornings each and every week. I can't tell you the influence it had upon me. Simple thing, a good athlete, two or three years older than me, living his faith in a very honest way. And here I am as a young set, uh, ninth grader, just getting started. Wonder about this church thing. He was an example. The same is true for all of you. The way you live your life every day is important. And finally, um, in your support for Malta, in the gifts you give financially, the gifts you give your time and talent, your food, kitchen, whatever, um, these are the things we do. It's a sign of God's love. The extraordinary, the ordinary things. It's the Malta calls from us. My father, for me, is an example of doing that so well. A great, great gift. I would oftentimes say, in my DNA is my dad's kindness. My DNA is my dad's service to others. My DNA is basically the, the call to be uh, as good as you can be. What a gift it is to me. And I'm sure that gift with you. Thank you.